All right, well, welcome everyone. And thank you again for joining us on this lovely cloudy Tuesday. I'm actually really happy for these clouds because that means it's not quite 100,000 degrees outside today, but hopefully you guys are having a great day today. Um, we're going to have a little discussion about the revamped collection process. And you guys, my name's Noelle Hicks. I'm a shareholder here at Roberts Markel Weinberg Butler Haley. I see a couple of familiar names here on our teams today, so thanks so much for joining us. Um, you guys have heard this disclaimer before, but I want to give it to you one more time just to let you know that the presentation that I'm going to give you today is based on the law as it exists as of today, August 22nd, 2023. And I'm only presenting this information to you for educational purposes, and it's not legal advice. But if you do have questions, um, if you need legal advice relating to something that I say, please make sure you contact your attorney or you can give me a call or shoot me an email after today's presentation. So today we're going to talk about the collections process. There's a couple of changes that we need to make everyone aware of, and our goals for today are going to be to talk about um, assessment collection. We'll talk about uh, compliance with statutory requirements. We will evaluate the methods of collection understand our different enforcement techniques and the risks associated with that, and then we'll talk about the importance of collection policies. So the first thing that I want to do is kind of get the one of the new uh, things out of the way. So this is an amendment to Section 209.0094 that is going to take effect on September 1st, 2023. And basically, this has to do with filing an assessment lien. So this changes things and kind of adds a little bit more time on to when the association can file an assessment lien. So essentially, before you can even file an assessment lien in the real property records, the association has to send out at least two notices. The first notice has to go out via first class mail to the property owner's last known address. So that means whatever address the, the uh, property owner has provided to the association or that notice can go out via email to an email address that an, a homeowner has actually provided to a property owners association. Then there has to be a second notice. That second notice has to be provided by certified mail and it has to go out at least 30 days after the first notice was sent. Um, then you also have to wait an additional 90 days after that notice of delinquency is sent to the property owner before you can actually file an assessment lien. So this adds a pretty significant amount of time on to when an assessment lien can be filed. This is something that you guys need to take into consideration because this is a requirement for the association. So just keep this in mind. If there are any questions about this, about the timeline or about what needs to go into that notice, please reach out to me and I can help you out with that but I just wanted to make sure that we all know about this change. And again, it's gonna go into effect September 1st of 2023. All right, so let's talk about the assessment collection process a little bit. Of course, we're all familiar with our 209 letter. And so essentially the association can send out courtesy notices if it would like, but it definitely have to, has to, under the statute, send out what's called a 209 collection letter. And under section 209.0, 0064 and various other sections of the property code. There are requirements, things that are that must be contained in this letter for it to be compliant with Section 209. So, of course, it has to have an itemization of the total amount due. And this is the amount that once you put that in that 209 letter, the initial amount that the that the attorney will be collecting when, when we send out our first demand letter. So you have to make sure that this is an accurate amount and it contains all of the interest, all of the past due assessments, if there are any fines or other fees, uh, administrative fees or anything like that that should go onto the homeowner's account, all of that needs to be captured in that 209 letter. Of course, that letter needs to be sent out by certified mail. That's a requirement under the statute. It should also give a homeowner a 45-day period to cure. So that means 45 days from that letter, um, the, home, the homeowner has to make sure that they pay off that amount that's due. Now, of course, this was a change from 2021 that we all uh, remember that we previously had to give a homeowner 30 days. Now it's 45 days. So just keep that in mind that your 209 letters need to have 45 day time periods in them for a homeowner to cure. This Letter also needs to make sure that it payment, which include a payment plan, 
Um, and, and that's important because, of course, the statute requires it, but this is just another way to help the association out a little bit so the homeowner can't say that there were no options for a payment plan or there were no other options except for payment in full. If there are any attorney's fees on the account, that should be added into the 209 letter. That's um, required by Section 209.008. You also need in this 209 letter to make sure that you provide a homeowner with an opportunity to be heard. So that sort of language should be in there. The, the homeowner can request a hearing before the board um, and give them a timeline within which they must request that hearing. Uh, if the homeowner's common area usage is gonna be suspended for failure to make timely payments, that information should also be contained in the letter. And then, of course, that military notice that we all put in there, letting homeowners know that they might have some rights under the Service Member Civil Rights Act. Um, I think I said that correctly, but make sure that all of this information is contained in your 209 letter so that it can be a proper 209 letter. One of the things that we look at when you turn um, a matter over to our office is making sure that you guys have sent out a uh, completely compliant 209 letter. So that's really important. Oftentimes, homeowners will receive certain other information, like letting them know that a lien has been filed, so those lien affidavits or a balance due letter or a courtesy notice, like I mentioned. All of those things are fine. Those are other additional notices that the association can send, but it must make sure that it sends this final 209 collection letter so that we can implement the collection process properly once that file gets over to our office. All right, so once it does get over to our office, um, I want to go through the attorney collections workflow with you just a little bit. So there have been a couple of changes, and you might have heard us talk about this a little bit before, but of course there were some um, amendments to the FDCPA recently, not so recently, but recently, and um, we refer to that as Regulation F or Reg F. Um, and so once uh, th that's something that's actually only required by a debt collector, right? So some some um, management companies are referred to as de uh, debt collectors or fall in, underneath that definition under the FDCPA. Certainly the attorney's office, an attorney who is collecting on behalf of the association is also a debt collector. And so we are required under the FDCPA to send what's called a regulation F notice. There are certain requirements that go into this notice. I won't get into the details of it, but it's something that we have to send out before we send out a demand letter. And it gives a, a homeowner the option to pay. It gives them a couple of other options, but this is something that's required for debt collectors to do. And so that's the first step in our collections workflow. Now, of course, this is after we have brought in the file, set it up, done the, the required searches, making sure that the homeowner is not um, in bankruptcy or that the homeowner has, is not deceased or that the property is actually still in the homeowner's name or it's not up for foreclosure by another entity or something like that. So once that Reg F um, notice is expired, then we're going to go ahead and send out our demand letter. Under the FDCPA, we have to uh, provide a, a homeowner with 35 days to respond or to make payment before we can move on and do anything else. So once the Reg F notice has expired and then the demand letter has expired, then we can actually move on to our lawsuit. But there are certain other things that kind of come in in between that. So let's say, for example, in response to a Reg F notice or a demand letter, a homeowner contacts us and disputes the debt and says they don't owe this debt or they don't owe the, the amount that we've, re we've requested in our letter, then we would send them what's called a validation of debt notice. Um, oftentimes, if there is, uh, if we're going to file a lien on behalf of the association, then we have to uh, make sure that we provide the homeowner with notice of that lien. And so that is required um, under the code, and we have to provide 15 days notice of that as well. If there is an inferior lien holder, so that means if there's a lien holder who has an inferior priority to the association, then we have to let them know that we've initiated our collection process and we send them a lien holder letter, and that letter um, comes with a 60 day, 61 day expiration period. So those are all the different types of letters that we might send from our office in what we call the pre-collection or the pre-litigation um, time period. So this is all something that gets done before a lawsuit is filed. Now also under Regulation F, we have been limited um, in our collection with homeowners by the, these new Regulation F uh, rules. And so one of the ways that um, our, we are limited to uh, communicate with the homeowner is uh, by what's called opting out. So in that Regulation F notice that I was mentioning before, 
Uh, we have to provide a homeowner with an option to opt out of communications from the debt collector or our office. So that's one limitation that is provided by Regulation F. And another one is the seven and seven rule. That's interesting because that's not actually something that we would do, but I can understand with other debt collection agencies, perhaps they would be contacting a homeowner every day trying to get in contact with them. But this rule makes it so that you cannot um, communicate with the homeowner seven consecutive days. So, and not necessarily communicating them, but reaching out to them um, seven consecutive days. So this makes it so, you know, the FDCPA was put in place to make sure that homeowners or, or people who are in debt, right, aren't being harassed by debt collectors or creditors or anything like that. But this makes makes it so that consumers are protected from being overwhelmed by creditors. Of course, we're not doing that. We're not going to be contacting someone seven days consecutively, but this just kind of gives certain protections to homeowners and limits the amount of communication that we that we can have. Um, there's also another aspect of that too, because if you actually communicate with the homeowner within that seven day time period, the clock kind of starts over from the date that you actually make contact with the homeowner, but then the homeowner has to actually give you consent to contact them again. So this is a whole thing, right? But in general, you know, we send out letters and allow for homeowners to contact us. So it makes things a little bit different, but these are the rules that you guys just should be aware of and things that we have to do internally to make sure that we are complying with the FDCPA as well. All right, so before we can actually get to that stage of lawsuit, right, we've already sent out our Regulation F notice, we've sent out our demand letter, and we've received no response from a homeowner. Um, there are certain prerequisites to a lawsuit. So one of those is under Section 209.0051 of the Property Code, and that relates to open board meetings. Um, as many of you have probably seen in our prior or other presentations that we've done, there are at least 15 things that a board must discuss in an open board meeting. And one of those things is the initiation of foreclosure actions. So that means that the board has to, in an open board meeting, consider or vote, vote on whether or not we're going to go forward with the initiation of foreclosure action. And of course, we don't really want you to do that in the open session of a board meeting because the property code protects homeowners from having their personal confidential information or information related to their assessment account discussed in open or in public. And so this is something that could be considered in executive session or it can be discussed in open session, but just by you know account numbers or something that doesn't identify the owner directly. Um, of course, if it is discussed in executive session, you need to make sure that once that executive session, executive session is closed, then you are summarizing orally what has happened during that executive session and placing that information in the meetings, but it should be done in general terms and not identifying the homeowner so you're not breaching the privacy of that individual homeowner and you're not violating any privilege or anything like that. And you also want to make sure that you're not disclosing any confidential information that could affect uh, one of the parties, especially if one of the homeowners requests that. Also, keep it in mind here that minute, meeting minutes are discoverable. So that's kind of why we want to make sure that these things are done in general terms. And when you're keeping your meeting minutes, just generally making sure that they are done in general terms, you should not be putting paragraphs or you know, a, a whole play by play of things in your meeting minutes because you don't want that to come up later on in discovery um, during litigation. So there are some pitfalls that we should discuss, and these these are kind of things that come up pretty often. And and actually, the the most the most thing that comes up, you know, as as frequently as as ever, right, is partial payments. So a lot of times, homeowners will send in what they think is the correct amount or what they want to pay. Well, there is a um, provision in the legal world called accord and satisfaction. So if a homeowner sends in a partial payment, and this is a partial payment to the management company or even to our office, then the rules of accord and satisfaction say that if you accept that payment, then you're essentially agreeing to discharge whatever is left on that homeowner's account or whatever other existing obligation there is for that homeowner. And that's not something that we want to do, which is the reason why we strongly discourage accepting partial payments, because it can thoroughly confuse things. An owner is essentially getting the idea that the association is accepting that lesser amount 
as a full and final settlement of their account. And whether or not this is done accidentally on, or on purpose, it can create a lot of problems because, again, it confuses things and makes it so the association has a more difficult time uh, pursuing the full amount uh, that's owed on that homeowner's account. So we have to be careful about partial payments. And, and here's some of the, the complications that, that come into play with, with partial payments. So not only are we talking about that accord and satisfaction, but we have to really decide whether or not we're going to keep or return that partial payment because you have to really look at certain factors. For example, looking at the timing of that payment. So this really comes into play really if there are monthly payments or monthly assessments that are owed to the association and a homeowner makes one partial payment um, and they make it on a date when uh, maybe the next day another partial payment or another assessment becomes due, then that would be very confusing. Um, very, very confusing for not only the homeowner, but for the association. So in this situation, it's really important to keep keep track of of the accounting, right? Making sure that the accounting is done properly. But I just would recommend that you not accept um, any partial payments if the homeowner is delinquent. You also have to make sure that you're keeping track. If, if there is a, uh, that payment is kept, right? If that payment is deposited, keep, amount, keep a, a track of the amount of the shortfall. Um, there's also certain statutory requirements under section 209.0063, which I'll talk about in a second that we have to, take into consideration. That's the priority of payment statute. Um, and so that is something that could actually become more complicated because if you accept a partial payment, um, some homeowners can be very savvy, right? Sometimes they will send in partial payments that are uh, that cover the amount of assessments that are past due only. And so then the outstanding amounts are the attorney's fees or the interest or the fines. And we can't file suit on things that are only um, assessments or so, excuse me, only in, uh, interest or attorney's fees or fines, right? So these are kind of things to just keep in mind. And, and part of the reason why we, we don't recommend accepting partial payments. Um, another thing that we have to look at too is if a homeowner sends in a check uh, for payment and partial payment or not, and there is some sort of limiting instruction or a restrictive endorsement on that payment. So if a homeowner owes assessments for 2021 to current, and they send in a payment that uh, on the check they write in, that this is the payment for assessments for 2023 only, then you have to kind of figure out what that means and whether or not you should accept that payment and then what it should be applied to if you do accept that payment. I would recommend that the payment not be accepted because again, that can confuse things and that makes it so the association doesn't have as much leverage as it could um, when you have to get to the stage of a lawsuit, if you have to get to the stage of a lawsuit. Um, but these are just things that we want you to keep in mind. Also, if you do accept that payment and it has that limiting instruction on there, then that could equal payment in full. And so you want to just make sure that you are keeping an eye on that. And then again, um, the statutory requirements under 209.0063, which is the priority payment statute. Um, there are differences if the homeowner is already on a payment plan and they, they are making payments that are less than the agreed upon amount then that's something that the association 100% does not have to accept because that's not what the terms of the agreement were uh, for the payment plan. So again, these are just things we want to point out to you guys for you to keep in mind, you know, if it if it doesn't smell right, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit in the in in just a minute, then you don't want to accept that payment or you want to consult with your attorney to make sure that it's something that the association should accept. Um, because you just don't want to make it so that it, it's more difficult for you in the future to be able to collect or file a lawsuit if that's what's necessary. All right, so I talked about 209.0063. This is the priority of payment statute. I'm sure that most of you guys have seen this before, but just to kind of go over it again, um, when you receive a payment from, from an owner, then it should be applied according to delinquent assessments first then to current assessments, then to attorney's fees, um, then to fines, and then any other amount that's owed to the association. If the association, um, we recommend, I recommend that the association adopt a priority of payment policy, because while this is listed in the property code, it's always better for the association to have adopted its own policy to make sure that homeowners are aware 
and realize that there is this priority of payment policy and that this is how their payments are being applied if they are delinquent on assessments. Now, keep in mind that this does not apply if the homeowner has already entered into a payment agreement or what the, the code refers to a, as an alternate payment schedule. Um, in any event, though, fines are never given priority. You can see that that's very near the end of that list right there. And also with fines, if that's the only thing that's left on the account, we cannot file a lawsuit on that. So that's another reason why priority of payments is really important. And also just you know, taking a look at whether or not you should accept a partial payment if that situation presents itself. All right, so with um, assessment collections, there are certain things that we need to have in place to make sure that we know, you know, when it's time to take the next step, um, you know, when things are at the attorney's office, so on and so forth. So it's important to have adequate controls in place. It's very important to flag an account or have some sort of notification on an account when that account is with the attorney's office because you don't want to do things with that account, like enter into a payment agreement or accept a partial payment if that account has already been turned over to legal. So that's something to already keep in mind, right? Um, also, you wanna make sure that if you do accept payments, so let's say, for example, the homeowner comes to the association directly when the account is already with legal, you wanna make sure that you communicate the fact that you've accepted payment, any sort of payment, whether it's partial payment or payment in full to the attorney. I also would recommend that if a homeowner comes to the association directly, you should either one, refer them to the attorney's office or two, contact the attorney's office to get whatever the balance is in full and then communicate that to the homeowner um, and let them know what, the, what they should actually be paying. There's a lot of times when the amount that the association has or the management company has is different than what the attorney has because attorney's fees have been added or interest has been added or recalculated or something like that. So you just make sure that those numbers are the same and then we'll be all good. You should also make sure that employees and board members are just kind of trained on this thing because consider this, you know, homeowners are neighbors and there will be some times where a delinquent homeowner will go to a board member because they are his neighbor and they've known them for, you know, a, a period of time and try to have a conversation with them about their delinquent account. And there might be a situation where a board member makes a promise to a homeowner that may not necessarily be a promise that they can actually fulfill, but it's just simply because the home, the board member didn't know or you know didn't have the knowledge that they needed in that situation. So it's important to impart this information to board members and other employees so that they know uh, what to do. And then also, make sure that they know what to say. So not only that they know what to do, but they know what to say. One of the things that I would always train a board member to say, especially if an account is with legal, is that you need to make sure to reach out to our attorney. Um, or you know, if they want to contact the management company to get the attorney's contact information, then that's what they should do. But they should always be directed to the attorney if it's already uh, the account's already with legal. I see a couple of questions popping up. Once I'm done, I will go ahead and address all of those questions and, and make sure that I, I get those answered. All right, so there are some debt collection laws that we are subject to as debt collectors. So there are some management companies that are debt collectors or fall underneath that definition of what a debt collector is. Certainly our office, attorney's office that collects um, debts on behalf of the association or collects assessments on behalf of the association falls within that definition of a debt collector under the FDCPA. And the debt collection laws are very consumer heavy. In other words, they are designed to make sure that they are protecting a consumer. And the standard that the FDCPA uses is the least sophisticated consumer standard. And I this basically just means that they are um, considering that a consumer can just basically read. And so they don't want to, you know, bring in law are too complicated, even though they're very complicated. Um, but they want to just make sure that a consumer is protected from being taken advantage of by a debt collector or someone who is more savvy than the consumer is. So federal laws, these apply to attorneys, not management companies. I'll talk about the ones that actually apply to both attorneys and management companies in just a second. But the federal um, laws that I'm talking about are the FDCPA, 
if there's any violation of those laws, you can we can we can be um, charged a fine of up to a thousand dollars per violation, plus all costs of the debtor who whoever made the the complaint or whoever was found to have been um, harassed or that we violated the FDCPA uh, with that debtor, right? And so some of the typical violations that actually come up. And keep in mind, these are not things that necessarily managers need to worry about, but these are things that us as attorneys need to worry about in the collection process because we are subject to the FDCPA. But some of these rules that we see here will be very similar to the ones that we'll see in the rules that apply to management companies as well. So um, some of the violations that typically occur are disclosure to a non-owner. This one actually happens more than you would think. Sometimes people will call and they will pretend to be the owner or they will say that they're related to the owner and they are calling to make a payment and they're just trying to get the information of how much it is so they can just make the payment today and get this over with. Well, we cannot disclose any amounts to a non-owner. So if someone calls and they are not the person who is listed on the account or the person who actually owns the property in this situation, then we have to make sure that we get a third party authorization form, which authorizes someone else to communicate with us on behalf of this homeowner um, about the debt. Another violation is if someone disputes the debt earlier, I mentioned that's one of the rights that a homeowner has or that a, a person, a consumer has. Um, if we fail to provide a verification of debt, if we fail to send out any of the required notices that I mentioned to you at the beginning of our presentation, um, if we attempt to collect a debt outside of the statute of limitations, you probably have heard this one a lot too. So the statute of limitations for collection is four years. So if we attempt to collect a debt that let's say um, happened in 2010, for example, then we are violating the FDCPA that is outside of that four year statute of limitations. And that's the reason why it's such a big deal for us to stay within that four years and for example, get a, a lawsuit filed um, before that four years is up because that is a safe harbor um, that, that we like to call it to make sure that we are outside of the FDCPA. Uh, we don't want to mischaracterize the debt. That's also a, a violation. I mentioned to you what the seven and seven rule is. So if we violate that, then that's something that we can get fined for. And then if we fail to comply with the debt dispute or out, uh, opt out procedures, again, those are typical violations of the FDCPA, things that we want to try to avoid. Now, in Texas, the debt collection laws apply to both attorneys and managers. And so that definition of debt collector applies to all of us, right? So it's a person who directly or indirectly engages in debt collection. Um, violations for the Texas debt collection laws could range from $100 to $500 uh, fines. There could also be a misdemeanor charge, and then also the owner could sue for injunctive relief, damages, and attorney's fees under the Texas Finance Code. So that's the reason why it's important for us to kind of mention these things and, and let you know what vi these violations could be so we can avoid them because we don't want to have situations where there are fines occurred or, or the homeowner is suing the association um, for violations of, of debt collection laws. I mentioned earlier that if something doesn't feel right, then it probably isn't right. So this is our sniff test. If you think it's not right, then it's probably not make sure you contact your legal counsel and ask questions um, before you act because you wanna make sure that you are not doing something that can get you sued. Um, so for example, if you know there's a homeowner account that is delinquent, but one of the board members knows this homeowner and knows that they are you know, terminally ill or if they're in the hospital or something is going on with that homeowner that's preventing them from making payment and they're not just willfully ignoring the fact that they have assessments due, then that would be a good time for someone to probably reach out um, because you know that that homeowner normally plays like clockwork and now they've not paid in a couple of years. So that's something that just doesn't pass the sniff test, right? Um, also, another kind of dead giveaway for something not being quite right is if there aren't any other debts on the property. So a lot of times I like to check to see if the property taxes haven't been paid. Um, because that means that the homeowner, maybe they've just abandoned the property and they're not interested in paying. Uh, but if they are being paid timely, then that's weird. So you need to just kind of look at those kinds of things to make sure that all, everything passes the sniff test. 
You don't want to get in a situation where we filed a lawsuit and incurred attorney's fees and then we get to court and the homeowner shows up and explains, you know, that they've just been diagnosed with some terminal illness or something like that. And then the judge is looking at us like, well, why did you file this lawsuit? So these are things that we should look at before we get to that stage. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our options for foreclosure. So if we get to the position where we filed a lawsuit and there has been no response from any homeowner, then we are going to do uh, obtain a judgment. We are going to obtain a default judgment or a summary judgment, depending on you know, what sort of communication we've gotten from a homeowner during the litigation process, or we could even obtain an agreed judgment. So if a homeowner has entered into a payment agreement with us, we also get them to enter into an agreed judgment. And if they default, then we could go ahead and abstract that judgment and move forward. So what we're looking for here is a money judgment because the homeowner has a personal obligation or um, they are required to pay personally this debt that they've incurred. Um, and this is what's created by the association's lien that's in the declaration. There are a couple of different types of foreclosure. The type of foreclosure that the association is authorized to do is usually listed in the declaration. Um, normally, it is judicial or non-judicial. For single-family homes, traditionally, it's judicial foreclosure. For condominiums, we could do a non-judicial foreclosure. There's also an option for expedited foreclosure. Uh, although expedited foreclosure is not that much different from ju judicial foreclosure, it doesn't really cost less, as some people think. And a lot of times, judges don't really know how it works. So judicial foreclosure is the better route for us to take. Now, if there is a foreclosure, so if the homeowner has completely ignored everything that we've tried to do, we've tried to send them letters, they've ignored it, we've served them with a lawsuit, they've ignored it, we've provided them with notice of a judgment, they've ignored all of that, the association can go ahead and foreclose, they give us the authority to go ahead and foreclose, and then the property actually sells at the foreclosure sale. Before the association can do anything or before the third party purchaser can do anything with this property, there is a right of redemption. So under 209, uh, you have to provide a homeowner with notice of the foreclosure sale 30 days of the sale, right? So they have to know that a sale is going to happen within 30 days. If the sale happens, then the association has to provide that no that an, an additional notice to the homeowner, but Give the, giving them 180 days to redeem the property. And what I mean by redeem is they must go ahead and pay the amount that the property foreclosed for. And depending on who purchased the property will actually dictate how much money they have to pay out. So for example, if a third party purchases it, then they have to pay that third party back the amount that they purchased the property for and also pay the association the judgment amount, right? So there's a lot of amounts that have to be paid here, but the property code gives 180 days for a homeowner to figure that out and determine whether or not they're actually going to try to redeem the property. They have to pay all of the amounts owed to the association. I mentioned that. They have to pay for all of the costs that were incurred by the association during the redemption period or by the third party purchaser during the redemption period. Um, they actually, there's actually provision for a lien holder also. So Earlier, I mentioned if there was a, a, a lesser priority lien holder, we have to send them notice that we're going to actually foreclose. And if someone else decides a, a different lien holder doesn't step in during the foreclosure process, so we foreclose, but they decide later on that they want to come in and redeem the property, then the property code does give them the option to do that, but it's 90 days after the sale happens. So at least for 90 days, a homeowner has an individual un- um, contested right to come in and try to redeem the property, but then another lien holder could come in within that, that 91st to 180th day and redeem the property themselves. So that's under 209. Under Chapter 82, there are similar procedures that I just mentioned in 209 for the right of redemption, but instead of 180 days, uh, Chapter 82 gives 90 days from the date of notice to redeem the property. All right, so... I talked a little bit about application of payment policies, but since we are discussing the collection procedure, then it is highly recommended that all associations have a collection policy. 
this policy is actually going to set forth all of the procedures that I've talked about and whatever the association's practices are for collection of delinquent assessments. This is really important to have, and it's not required. It's not required by the property code, but it's recommended because you can always point to your collection policy if there's some sort of dispute or some sort of, you know, um, anything that a homeowner can say. You can just say, well, we have this recorded collection policy that sets forth all of our procedures and it is public knowledge. It's posted on our website. You knew about it. And so now we're going to proceed with our lawsuit or whatever. So a collection policy is really important to have. It's something that we highly recommend. And here are some things that should be contained in your collection policy. Now, I don't want you guys to go out and try to like draft a collection policy yourself, but these are the things that we would make sure are contained in the collection pro uh, policy. So it should have the due date of assessments. This is something that you could probably get from your declaration. Typically, the declaration will say, that an assessment is due on the first of the year and then it becomes delinquent on the 31st of January or something like that. Um, it should also contain any costs that a homeowner would incur for delinquent assessments. So this means costs of collection, if there are administrative fees, if there's going to be any fees like certified mail fees, the fee for a letter that the association sends out or something like that, interest. Um, let them know that they would incur attorney's fees if it got sent over to um, to legal, and if there are any late fees that are authorized by the declaration, that should be contained in your collection policy as well. And this should let them know that those are all collectible against the property. They can be collected in the same way that assessments can, if that's what your declaration allows. Um, there should also be a general description of the number of letters that the association would send. So if we're gonna send a courtesy notice, then that needs to be stated in this collection policy. And certainly the final 209 notice that I mentioned earlier should be listed in this policy as well. The amount of the late charge and amount of interest should be contained in this policy. If there's a payment plan available, it should be listed there too. The property code has certain parameters for a payment plan, but the association can extend that payment plan for as long as it likes, um, well, to a reasonable amount of time so that a homeowner has time to be able to get back on track and go ahead and pay off that, that payment plan. And then it should also have a provision regarding the owner's mailing address. This is actually really, really important because you guys have no idea how many times we have homeowners call in and say, well, the association sent the letter to the wrong address. If there's a provision in your collection policy that says that it is the homeowner's responsibility to update the association with their current mailing address if they don't live on site, then you have an argument to dispute that or to defend against that, you know, that statement from a, from a homeowner. So your collection policy should definitely say that it's the homeowner's responsibility to make sure that their mailing address is updated in the association's database. Um, that's really important. Now, these are just the things that the collection policy should have, the, the bare minimum. It can be customized to include more things if the association would like, but these are just our recommendations for what the collection policy should have. And once the collection policy has been um, reviewed and it is approved, then that means that the board has to actually adopt that collection policy, um, and then it gets filed in the real property record. So for adopting it, uh, you have to make sure that the board has the power to implement rules and policies concerning, uh, concerning the collection of assessments. That's something that would be contained in the declaration or in the bylaws, um, generally in the bylaws. And then if it's not in the bylaws, then the Texas Business Organizations Code allows for the board of a nonprofit corporation to amend certain things, uh, bylaws, policies, and things of that nature. So that's something that we could look at too. And then it gets adopted during the board meeting. So I mentioned earlier that there were certain things that had to be done at an open board meeting, uh, amendment of dedicatory instru uh, instruments or the um, creation of dedicatory instruments is one of those things. A collection policy is a dedicatory instrument. So this board meeting has to be properly noticed. A quorum needs to be present and then the policy needed, needs to be approved during open session. So there might be some situation where your governing document has some sort of special requirements or something like that. So you may need to make sure you take a look into your governing documents or consult with your attorney to make sure that the board has the authority to do this. And if there are any special requirements, but this is the general procedure for adopting a policy. 
All right. So, of course, a lot of what I've mentioned today has to do with what the association should do for uh, collection, right? And of course, I've, I've gone over what we do here internally, our workflow uh, about how we handle things for collection as well. But when the association intends to turn a file over to the attorney, there are certain things that you need to make sure are included in that file turnover. Um, so for example, we have to have the owner's information so that we can conduct our searches properly. So again, make sure that the property is owned by that owner, for sure. That owner is not in bankruptcy that owner is has, has not died or anything like that. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a fully compliant 209 letter. We're going to review those as soon as you turn that over anyway, but we just want to make sure that we're not doing anything to delay the collection process anymore. So the, the 209 letter is important. And then, of course, we need the account history, a fully up-to-date account history, so that we can input that into our system and make sure that we are completely aware of the setup, or excuse me, uh, of the amounts that needs to go into our initial letters. So once we um, get that file, we actually have an internal procedure where we create an information sheet that's specific to each association that makes it so that we have an easily accessible document that gives us all the specifics for every association. It lets us know what interest um, should be charged it lets us know when assessments are due, whether or not there are other lien holders and things like that. Um, once we get that file, we're going to confirm that account history and make sure that we're confirming all of the charges on there. We will internally assign users, um, you know, to make sure that we have dedicated team members working on those accounts. And I mentioned before, but we're going to make sure that we don't have any conflicts with this account. We're going to do our title search. And we are also going to perform that bankruptcy search to make sure, one, we're not violating any FDCPA rules, but also, you know, a violation of bankruptcy laws can be very crazy. So we want to make sure that we are not violating those as well. All right, so that completes my presentation. I'm going to go on to the questions that you guys had. But also, I just wanted to remind you, we would love it if after the presentation is over with, if you guys would go on to Google and give us a review, of course, I want five stars only, um, but Kyle is going to send you a link so that you guys can easily access it. And thank you so much for doing that in advance. So let me go to our questions. I have a lot of questions, so I'll try to get through them. Um, I'll try to get through them all before we're, we're done here. So one of the first questions is, can you speak to fines or interest applied to collection situations? So. First of all, fines, uh, the, the declaration will speak to whether or not the association is allowed to include interest on delinquent assessments and whether or not you can fine a homeowner for violations of the deed restrictions, right? If those things are allowed in your governing documents, then they can be applied to the homeowner's account based on whatever your collection policy says or whatever your fining policy says. I recommend having a fining policy so that you can designate the amount of fines for violation, or you can do it according to how many letters that you have to send out for the homeowner to comply with the restrictions. But definitely those things have to be um, allowed in your declaration. And so if that's the case, then you are, are well within your rights to go ahead and add that to the homeowner's assessment account. Um, the next question is, what are payment plan requirements or payment plan parameters? So there is a section in, in um, 209 of the property code that says that the homeowner can be offered a payment plan anywhere between three to six months, I think, um, or it has to be at least three months. But again, as I mentioned, the association can offer a homeowner a payment plan for a longer amount of time if it sees fit to do that. Um, but that's something that should be done on a case by case basis, because you might want to look at whether or not you think that this homeowner will actually be able to pay off something in a lesser amount of time. Or if you think they'll need uh, a greater amount of time, this is something that could be discussed during a hearing. If a homeowner requests a hearing before the board to discuss, you know, why they have been unable to pay their assessments or something like that, then that's something that the board should take into consideration when determining the length of the payment plan. But also, I would recommend to, um, along with your collection policy, you might want to put the parameters for the payment plan 
in in there because then that would make it a little bit easier for homeowners to know exactly what the association would be willing to do as far as the payment plan. Uh, will the time period still apply to those owners that live outside the U.S. when mail is not received timely? So the uh, we operate under what's called the mailbox rule. And once an article of mail is placed in the mailbox, then the time starts and we have no control over it when it gets delivered or when a homeowner actually sees it. So we start that clock uh, based on what the what the statute provides or the amount of time the statute provides. Um, off of either the date that we put it in the mail or the date that we have listed on the letter. Generally, it'll say you'll have 35 days from the date of this letter to respond or whatever. So we have no control over when a homeowner actually receives notice. Um, so, you know, if they're going to be out of the country, that's another reason why it's important to have some somewhere it states that a homeowner needs to provide the association with their updated mailing address or they should opt into receiving emails from the association so they can get their mail that way. Um, can a HOA deny voting rights when a homeowner is delinquent in assessments? I believe the answer to that question is no. Um, but George, I need to get back to you on that, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that the answer is no. Um, partial payments should be rejected only when the owner is in collections or any time. I would recommend that partial payments are never accepted. And, and, and I, I kind of explained this before, but just to make it a little bit more clear, it is so confusing when a homeowner sends in a partial payment because you have to then recalculate all sorts of things. So let me give you an example. A homeowner that is delinquent from, let's say, 2000 to 2003, right? These are old dates, but stick with me here. So if a homeowner makes a partial payment, let's just say the, the assessments are $1,000 annually. So that means that they are past due $3,000 but every year interest is accruing on that account. If a homeowner makes a partial payment of $1,000, for example, then that $1,000 has to be applied to the year 2000 assessment first. So then that means that you apply that amount based on the date that it was received and you have to recalculate interest. So it can be very, very confusing to accept a partial payment, which is part of the reason why we don't recommend doing it. Um, and unless they, they're on a payment plan, because when they're on a payment plan, you can control what the payments are being received. You have a better idea of, you know, this payment goes to this amount and, and takes care of this amount of interest and so on and so forth. So I would recommend never receiving partial payments or never accepting partial payments, returning those to homeowners with an explanation of why you're returning them. Um, but just make it very clear, you know, this is the amount that you need to pay, and we're only going to accept partial payments if you are in a payment agreement, and the partial payment is what we agree to on a monthly basis or whatever. Um, let's see. Payments can be made through our website. If a, par a partial payment is made, can it be returned? Yes. Um, and I don't know if they, in your website has the capability to uh, return payment or if you're, having to, if you're going to have to send a, a check back to the homeowner, but here's something else you can do, too. Um, because it can be cumbersome to return a payment that's received online. You can always reach out to the homeowner and say, we've received your partial payment and you have until this date to pay the remaining balance on your account. Otherwise, the payment is going to be returned to you and your account will be charged whatever amounts we incur for returning that payment to you. So there's another option that you can do. All right, what does a POA do if an owner doesn't accept or pick up certified mail and it's returned? should the POA send a FedEx letter or something similar? So this is part of the reason why we recommend sending letters by certified mail and return mail, so that if they don't pick up the certified mail, they would still receive the return mail, or sorry, the regular mail. Um, but you have to be trying to send it by email if you can. But again, that mailbox rule that I, that I explained earlier, once you've sent out that letter, you are not responsible for making sure that the homeowner actually receives it. It's on the it's on the homeowner to make sure that they've given you the proper information for you to actually send that letter out. OK, the next question is how to handle a situation where the POA is aware the property owner is deceased. So um, when you have a deceased homeowner, it can be really complicated because you don't know who's going to take over the house. Um, but that would be a good time for you to contact the association's attorney, because what we have to do is actually look to see whether or not there has been a probate opened on behalf of that homeowner's estate 
or we might have to look for heirs for you to send a 209 letter to. What I would recommend you doing is if you don't reach out to the attorney to kind of find out who the heirs are, if there's a probate, then you send a letter to the homeowner plus the unknown heirs of the homeowner. So then that way, once the attorney gets the letter, we have a little bit more flexibility on who we can send it to. Keep in mind that whatever you put on that 209 letter is what we have to stick to. So sometimes you will hear, um, you'll get a notification from us um, that says, you know, you need to send out a new 209 letter because the homeowner is deceased, for example. And here is who you address the, the letter to. And it'll say homeowner plus the unknown heirs of whatever the homeowner's name is. So that would help us because we can't um, send out letters and then file a lawsuit against someone different. So the homeowner, the, the letter has to contain the name of the homeowner, and that's what goes onto our lawsuit. So we have to be very specific about the information we're including on our 209 letters. Let's see, if the property owner pays the regular amount after already being notified of the late fee interest, should that payment be returned so that they could pay the appropriate amount? Yeah, I would recommend returning the payment. But again, if you want to um, give the homeowner an opportunity to pay that remainder, then you can reach out after you've received that payment and say, hey, listen, we received your payment. You have until the 30th, for example, to pay the late fees and interest that are still in your account. Um, another option, if you can't get in touch with the homeowner and you've gotten a significant amount of your payment, is go ahead and apply that payment and then leave that late fee and interest on the account. Unfortunately, it will likely continue to um, accrue interest the way that it, the way interest does. Um, but you have at least reached out to the home, homeowner and given them another opportunity to make that full payment. Referring to your comment on owners as neighbors, it is a is it appropriate to contact the delinquent owner in person or by phone and at their home or business if they are the owner of a business and you can meet in private. I would ne never recommend contacting an owner at their business if you have any other options. Um, I don't mind contacting a delinquent homeowner over the phone um, if you know there's an issue. So earlier I was talking about the sniff test. If you know that there is some issue, then you can reach out to a homeowner and you know have try to have a conversation but it's best to notify homeowners of their delinquent accounts the way that you're supposed to, which is under the, the property code or whatever your collection process says, and that's to send them um, a letter. Okay, do payment agreements need to be voted on by the board to be approved before starting, and in what setting does the vote need to occur? No, you don't have to vote um, on giving a homeowner a payment agreement because you're required to give them the, the ability to enter into a payment agreement under 209. So that's not something that the board has to vote on. But what I would recommend is if you don't have a collection policy in place that talks about what your payment plan options would be, then the board should provide the management company with whatever parameters they would be comfortable with um, allowing. So up to a certain amount. So let's say, for example, you would be comfortable just generally giving up to a 12 month payment plan, then that's something that your management company should know and that they can give a homeowner any sort of payment plan up to 12 months. But then maybe if they want something like 18 months, then the board should discuss it. If there's some sort of issue or reason why they need 18 months, those are all things that should go into the consideration of go ahead and giving them that 18 month time period. All right, if the property owner is deceased, do we need a third party notification from the executor of the state? If there is an executor of the estate, then there should be some documentation from the estate that has that gives that um, heir or a designated person the ability to speak with the attorney or the management company. And it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a third party authorization, but perhaps they have been provided with letters testamentary from the probate or something like that. It gives them the authority to speak on behalf of the estate or to um, enter into negotiations or make payments on behalf of the estate. Does a violation have to be sent by certified mail in order to be collectible? Right, so under the property code, both a collection matter, so a delinquent assessment, and a violation of the use restrictions have to be sent by certified mail. So the answer to that is yes. How are board members to know what is the status of a delinquency as far with uh, as with management company or with the attorney? So from our office, I can speak from our perspective. We provide status reports to let let you know management company or the board know 
the status of the accounts that we have in our office. So all you have to do is reach out to us and we can provide that status report. Um, the status report generally will get sent to the manager. So from us, accounts that we have in our office, that's what will happen. I'm not sure how board members would get um, status from management companies, but I I assume that it's something similar, that there's some sort of status report that could be reviewed during board meetings to let them know what the status of certain accounts is. Um, should board members see 209 demand letters from management company to members? That's not necessary. It's not a requirement. If you know what your 209 letter says, it should be kind of like a template, essentially, and all you're doing is plugging in the new homeowner's information with the delinquency amount, and that can be sent out to homeowners without being reviewed by the board. Should board members see various letters issued to homeowners? I, I don't think that that's necessary. Um, again, those letters should be templates that are generated by the management company. And so once the go-ahead is given to actually send out that notice, it does not need to be reviewed. And, and the same question with should board see payment plans? I don't think that's necessary unless there are some extenuating circumstances. All right, so from start to finish, uh, I think I have time for like two more questions. And whatever else that I don't get to, I will answer. I'll send you an email and answer it if you'd like for me to, because um, I have quite a few more questions on here. So from start to finish, once a homeowner is past due, if you send all notices and letters when you are allowed, how long does it take to get to the foreclosure sale? This is, you're not going to like this, but it's in, it depends because it depends on whether or not a homeowner actually engages once they've received any of these letters or notices. Sometimes homeowners don't pay attention to letters or notices at all, but what they do pay attention to is being served with a lawsuit. So if they actually get served with the lawsuit and then they engage, then that might you know, take a little bit longer. But if you think about it, you have um, you know, 35 days, 35 days at least for those demand letters. So I would say at least 60 to 90 days before you can actually get to a lawsuit. After a lawsuit is filed, an owner has at least 20 days to respond. Then we have to file a motion. We might have to wait on courts to actually set those motions for hearing. Once a judgment is final, then you have to wait, or once a judgment is granted, then you have to wait 30 days for it to become final. So it could take several months to you to get for you to get to the foreclosure state, stage. But again, it depends on the level of communication or engagement you're getting from a homeowner. Um, was the requirement to send a two additional certified 209 letters prior to the attorney for um part of the legislation that has passed. Okay, so this question relates to the assessment lien um, notice that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And this is actually for associations and not for attorneys. So this is part of the new legislation that came up um, and it will go into effect September 1st, 2023 from this recent legislative session. So this is something that associations need to do and not attorneys send out at least two notices before the assessment lien can be filed unless of course you want us to send it out which we can or your attorney can and we have to follow the same process so yes this is part of the new legislation that will become effective september 1st um, is there a template available for boards to create a payment plan that's in accordance with property code there's no template. Um, every policy that we create, it gets created based on the specifics of the association. So no, there's not a template, but we certainly can create one for you. Um, and the last question I'll answer is, I often hear properly noticed meeting. If a meeting is held via Zoom or owners can opt in for Zoom, does the proper notice include time, place, subjects, and Zoom instructions? That's correct. So proper notice is going to make sure it has the location, it's going to be, it's going to have the time, it's going to have the Zoom instructions. If you're going to have the meeting by Zoom, it's going to be sent out within the um, amount of time prescribed by the property code and in the different manners, right? So either by mail or by email or posted in a, conspicu a conspicuous area for everyone to see, um, sent out uh, by e-blast, or if you guys use something like Town Square, it can be sent out by by that method or whatever. But you have to just make sure that it's it's properly sent out um, according to whatever the the property code says. Maybe I have time for one more. Um, it looks like Kyle has already put in the Google review um, link, so thank you for that. Um, you stated that all charges should be on the two online letter. Does that include lien fee? Yeah. So everything, any amounts that have uh, uh, accrued on the homeowner's assessment account before it gets to our office, all of that needs to be 
on the 209 letter. So anything from the date, the first date of delinquency and forward, that should be on the 209 letter and send out to the homeowner. All right, it is 1230. Um, I want to make sure that we stay within our time parameters. I will answer, I'll get Kyle to send me the rest of these questions and I will answer them individually if I can. If you guys have anything else that you need to know from me, just send me an email. I'm at nhicks at rmwbh.com. Thank you so much for joining me during your lunch hour today, and I will see you guys during the next webinar. Thanks.